Hello and welcome. In this video tutorial, we're going to take a look at Newton's laws of motion. In doing so, we're going to examine different forces that interact between different objects, what those forces uh, cause, and uh, any symbols or variables we might use to represent them. Along the way, we will also take a look at how to draw a free body diagram showing those force interactions on an object. And then finally, we're going to look at the uh, analysis of those forces uh, in terms of them being either balanced or unbalanced. Let's begin. Remember to pause or rewind the video as you need to. Forces. Well, forces are defined as a basic push or a pull. Okay, now we can define different kinds of forces. We can start off with the force of gravity. The force of gravity would be the force that attracts any two objects. In fact, that's, uni that's uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation, which states that every object in the universe attracts every other object in the universe. So gravity is not a force that is internal to any object. Gravity is the force of attraction that attracts one object to another. Uh, your weight, for instance, is a measure of Earth's gravitational attraction to you. Normal force. Well, we looked at a normal force in our Newton's first law lab with the little rolling ball along the straight track, and it rolled through two little photo gates, and we examined the... Uh, force of gravity acting down on the ball, and the surface was applying an upward force called the normal force. Well, normal forces need to be perpendicular, and they need to be from a surface. So you need to have a surface, and it's a perpendicular force applied from the surface onto an object. Uh, the symbol, by the way, I forgot to mention for uh, the force of gravity is F sub G. The symbol for normal force is the letter N. The next force is friction. Well, friction is a force that opposes or sometimes even prevents motion. The symbol we're going to use for that is a lowercase f. The next force is a tension force, and that is the force that pulls along a string or a rope, a cable, a wire, or a chain. And a capital T can be used for tension. Next, we have a spring force. A spring force happens when we stretch or compress a spring. The variable F sub S is going to stand for spring force. And lastly, we have an applied force. An applied force is any contact force, push or pull. So when we grab something and we pull on it, that's an applied force. If we, you know, push a shopping cart, that's an applied force, right? So any contact push or pull is an applied force. And a generic capital F will be the variable we use for that. Free body diagrams. Well, what are they? Free body diagrams are drawings that show what the object is, and they show all the forces acting on that object. Now, typically, those a free body diagram is drawn as a dot, and then from that dot, we draw the forces outward in all directions. We can also draw a free body diagram as a generic force diagram where we draw a more realistic picture of the object and show the forces coming from where they interact with that object. You'll see what I mean in the next example. A block being pulled along a friction, frictionless table by a string. Okay, let's draw the following. Go ahead and draw yourself a table. And on the table, go ahead and draw uh, an object, a block of some sort. And we're going to put a, a line here that's going to represent a rope. And so what forces are pulling on this thing? Well, frictionless, so we don't have friction. But here's what we do have. We have a tabletop, and the tabletop is exerting a normal force perpendicular and upward. And we label that with a lowercase n. 
Then we draw a force of equal length. So however long the normal force is, that's how long we draw the weight going straight down. The weight is the force of gravity going straight down. You can label it F sub G, or you can label it W for weight. That would be fine. In fact, let's go ahead and label that in here. We can label it F sub G or W for weight. Either one works. Now, since we're pulling, the, since the block's being pulled by a string, we have now a tension force that is horizontal pulling the object to the side. If there were friction, we would draw friction from the point where the block interacts with the table, and we would draw it opposite the direction of motion. Since we're moving this way, friction opposes that motion that way. But since we were told there's no friction in this problem, we're going to go ahead and neglect that. Example two, now add friction. So what we're going to do, I want you to take a second to copy the exact same picture. Everybody copy the exact same picture. Pause the video until you do that. Okay, now that you have the picture drawn, what we're going to do is we're going to add friction. And friction always opposes motion. So let's say the tension is causing motion to happen in this direction here. That must mean friction must be acting in the opposite direction there. And we always draw it at the interaction where the surface uh, meets the object and then going opposite the direction of motion. How to calculate the force of gravity? Well, the force of gravity has a calculation and it is F sub G is equal to M times G where F sub G is the force of gravity, or the weight, right, again in Newtons, M is the mass in kilograms, and G is the acceleration due to gravity. Now, the acceleration due to gravity, you are used to the units being meters per second squared, and that's fine, that is accurate. But another unit for acceleration is also Newtons per kilogram. So we're just going to write this as 9.8 newtons per kilogram instead of meters per second squared. I'm going to say 9.8, let's use 9.8 for labs only. When we're doing a lab that involves G, we're going to put G equals 9.8. However, for everything else, round G up to 10 newtons per kilogram. You'll see how much easier it makes the calculations when we do that. Let's take a look. Example, I'm gonna call this part A, B, C. An object has a mass of two kilograms. The gravitational field strength on the moon is 1.6 newtons per kilogram. Gravitational field strength is another word for G, the acceleration due to gravity. So the acceleration due to gravity is also known as the gravitational field strength. And the gravitational field, ladies and gentlemen, is just an invisible, uh, it's an invisible field that expresses the strength of the gravitational force. So a very small field means a small attractive gravity force. A large field has a large attractive gra gravitational force. All right, so how do we calculate in part A the weight on Earth? Well, F sub G equals mg. We're gonna take two kilograms times, remember G, we're gonna round up to 10 unless we're doing a lab, right? So 10 newtons per kilogram, right? And the two kilogram object is gonna weigh 20 newtons on Earth. Part B, what's the object's mass on the moon? Well, here's what we need to understand about that. Mass stays constant. 
everywhere in the universe. In other words, mass measures in kilograms the amount of size of an object. If we take that object to the moon, from the Earth to the moon, it's not going to get bigger or smaller. It's going to keep the same size. Therefore, if the size stays the same, the mass is going to stay the same. And so the mass is still 2 kilograms, even on the moon. However, part C is now asking what's the object's weight on the moon. Well, the weight is going to be different because the gravity on the moon is significantly less. So let's calculate it. F sub G equals mg, and we're going to take the same 2 kilogram mass, but this time we're going to multiply by a different G. This is the G on the moon as opposed to the G on the Earth. 1.6 newtons per kilogram. We can see kilograms cancels. And 2 times 1.6 is 3.2 newtons. Galileo Galilei was a scientist and inventor uh, who lived back in the 1500s in Italy. And he made many observations about motion. He did many experiments involving acceleration. He would roll balls down ramps. He would also drop things off towers. Some of the observations he made included rolling a ball up and down a ramp and along level surfaces. He, of course, noted that a ball rolling down a hill speeds up, a ball rolling up a hill slows down, and a ball rolling along a level surface seems to be moving at a constant speed. He noted that the ball speeding up and slowing down seemed to be doing so at a fairly constant rate. Although he was not able to quantify this, he certainly was able to put in some uh, very important observations that were quite ahead of his time. Newton's first law of motion. Well, Newton's first law of motion states that an object moving in constant velocity motion is going to keep doing that. It's going to keep moving in constant velocity motion unless an unbalanced force, in fact, or let's go ahead and underline that, unbalanced force an unbalanced force is called a is called a net force Okay, so let's reread. Uh, an object in motion, in constant velocity motion, that is, uh, and constant velocity can be one of two things. It can be either at rest, which is a constant velocity of zero, right? Constant velocity equal to zero. Uh, or you could just be moving with a constant speed, right? Either one. Okay, but an object in constant velocity motion is going to keep moving that way unless a net force changes that velocity. And of course, what happens when we change a velocity? You accelerate an object. Inertia. What is inertia? Inertia is a resistance to a change in speed. Inertia is related to mass. It's not equal to mass, but it's related to mass. Okay, how can we uh, make this a little clearer? If you are, let's say, a bigger object, you're going to have more mass. And if you have more mass, you have more resistance to changing your speed. It's harder to speed you up if you're bigger, and it's harder to slow you down when you're bigger. So if you have more mass, you have more inertia. Take, for example, a big, huge truck or a big city bus. It is a lot harder for a city bus to accelerate up to 60 miles per hour than it is a little sports car. Consequently, a little sports car can slow down and brake all of a sudden, whereas it takes a city bus a lot longer and a lot greater distance to 
uh, slow down to a rest. For each example, determine if the forces balance, okay, and then explain. We'll go, we're going to letter these off as A, B, and C. Letter A, a car traveling along a straight level road at a constant speed. Well, there's the concept right there. If we're moving at a constant speed, then in this situation, forces are balanced. That's Newton's first law. Okay. Uh, we not only move with constant speed, but we also move with a constant direction too. The direction doesn't change. We're going in a straight line. So straight, constant speed. Car slowing to a stop. So for slowing, we're accelerating. And if we're accelerating, forces are unbalanced. When forces are balanced, that's Newton's first law. When forces are unbalanced, ladies and gentlemen, that's Newton's second law, okay? And so what do we have here? The speed is changing. When the speed changes, we accelerate. Why do we accelerate? Because forces are unbalanced and cause the acceleration. Letter C, the moon orbits the earth at a constant speed. Now this one's tricky because we see constant speed and we're thinking, well, exactly this. Forces are balanced, therefore, well, no, not exactly. Let's draw a picture. Here's the earth. Here's the moon. Let's draw a dashed circle around the earth to represent its orbit, the moon's orbit around the earth. The velocity of the moon is constantly changing direction. These arrows represent the velocity that the moon is going to have at any point along its orbit. And since the velocity vector is changing, the, the object is accelerating. The moon, the moon's direction of velocity changes. Therefore, the velocity changes. Therefore, the moon is accelerating. Which means forces are unbalanced. Because only unbalanced forces cause acceleration. Now, in the next example, take a few minutes to type in these following questions. We have a picture of a mass that's being pulled up at a 20 Newton force at an angle of 50 degrees above the horizontal. We have some resistance force of 16 Newtons pulling to the left, and the object itself has a mass of 2 kilograms. Take a second to type in these two questions or write in these two questions for part A and part B. Okay, now that you've had a chance to get the questions down, let's take a look at what we should do to start a problem like this. The first step we should do is draw a free body diagram. A free body diagram is a diagram that shows all the forces acting on the mass. Okay, now we've got a special force that's at an angle, and we'll take care of that angle force in just a minute. It's going to involve a little bit of right triangle trigonometry in terms of using sine and cosine. However, we can come up with a nice little shortcut for that one, and I'll show it to you in just a second. Step two, we're going to apply... either Newton's first law or Newton's second law to forces in the x direction 
and forces in the y direction. Okay, and then the last step would of course be solve for any unknowns. That is the typical step and pattern for just about any Newton's law problem. It starts with a diagram though. So here's what we have. We do have some diagrams already. We do have some forces labeled, 16 Newtons going to the left, 20 Newtons up at 50 degrees above the horizontal. But we also see a surface here. So if I see a surface, I'm gonna draw a normal force going up like this, with labeled with the letter N. Then from the center of the mass, I'm gonna draw an arrow going down, and I'm gonna label it F sub G. However, I'm gonna put MG after it to remind myself how did, we, how did we learn to calculate the force of gravity. Remember, it's mass times G, and the number we're gonna plug in for G, of course, is 10. So let's actually calculate that right now. That's gonna be two kilograms times G, we use 10, Therefore, the weight, the force due to gravity, is 20 newtons going down. Now, be careful. The normal force is not going to be 20 newtons going up. Not in this case, because we have other forces that are pointing upwards as well. So now let's take care of that force that's at an angle. Okay. But before we do, <clears throat> let me draw something for you. Okay. And I'm going to draw it down here in the lower corner. Let's say we have a triangle, a right triangle to be specific, okay? And this is the opposite side, O for opposite side, A for adjacent side, and this is our angle theta, right? Remember, that symbol is the Greek letter theta, which stands for an angle measurement. And H stands for the hypotenuse, which is the long side, and that's opposite the 90 degree angle, right? Okay, so I'm going to set up something for you to remind you how the trigonometry worked, okay? And then we're going to jump right into a shortcut and apply that shortcut. Here it goes. If I used cosine of theta, now cosine of theta would be adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine of theta would be the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. Now, Let's do the sine of the angle. The sine of angle theta would be the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Now, what I want us to do is I want us to solve for the adjacent and opposite sides of the triangle. To do that, you're gonna multiply both of these equations by the denominator, which is the hypotenuse. And here's what you get. The adjacent side is the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle. The opposite side is the hypotenuse times the sine of the angle. There's your shortcut, ladies and gentlemen. Opposite always goes with sine. Adjacent always goes with cosine. And the hypotenuse is just simply whatever the vector that's pointing off at an angle. And in the case of the problem we're about to do, it's a force vector of 20 newtons. Okay, so let's apply this shortcut. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a right triangle out of this. I see 20 newtons is pointing up and to the right. I'm gonna draw a dashed line going to the right and, and I'm gonna do that in blue. And then I'm gonna draw another dashed line going up like this. And I'm creating a right triangle out of this, okay? The blue side is right next to 50. So that's the adjacent side right there. And the gray side is the side opposite the angle. So that would be the opposite side right there. The adjacent side is going to be the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle. And we saw that the opposite side is gonna be the hypotenuse times the sine of the angle. Well, what's this gonna be? It's going to be the hypotenuse is 20 times the sine of theta, which is 50 degrees. 
okay? And then over here, we've got 20 times the cosine of 50 degrees. Notice what's the only thing that's different. Opposite side goes with sine, adjacent side goes with cosine. That is a nice little shortcut to use, especially if you don't feel too confident with right triangle trigonometry at this point. All we have to do is be able to identify the opposite and adjacent side of a triangle. Let's see how to do this. Now, in the example I'm about to show you, I'm going to use a backward calculator. Remember, backward calculators, we put the angle first and then press the sine or cosine button. If you're using a forward calculator, you would literally put 20 times the cosine of 50 and 20 times the sine of 50. But if you're working with a backward calculator like I am, you'll do the following. You'll go angle, take the cosine, then times 20. Then you'll take the angle, uh, angle, take the sine of the angle, times 20. Let's take a look. I'm going to start with sine on the opposite side. The angle was 50, so I'm going to go 50 sine times 20. And you can see I get about 15.3 newtons. Now for the other side, I'm going to go 50 cosine times 20, and I get about 12.9 newtons. About 15.3 newtons going up and about 12.9 newtons going to the right. <laughs> Question part A, does the object accelerate? Well, it does not accelerate vertically because this block right here is not lifted off the floor. If it were lifted off the floor this way, then it would accelerate vertically but it doesn't. If it accelerates at all, it's gonna accelerate horizontally. And the only way to determine that is if the forces are balanced or unbalanced, right? So for part A, see if the horizontal forces specifically are balanced or unbalanced, okay? That's what we're gonna take a look at. Now, since we're looking at that, we have 16 Newtons going left and 12.9 Newtons going right. Clearly the forces are unbalanced. If we were going to calculate a net force, we would say 16 minus 12.9 because we take the causing force that causes acceleration and we subtract the opposing force that goes the other way. But we're simply answering the question, does it accelerate? Does it? Yes, it does because the forces are unbalanced. The object does accelerate. Which way does it accelerate? It's going to accelerate in the direction of the net force. Since the greater force is to the left, the net force is to the left, and the object accelerates to the left. We always accelerate the same direction as the net force. Part B. How much is the normal force? Well, the normal force is a vertical force. Now we need to look at the vertical forces. There are actually three vertical forces if you look carefully. There's this force here, the normal force. There's this force here, the force of gravity. And there's this third force, which is the, the opposite side of the triangle, the gray force vector that's pointing up, the 15.3 newtons. So here's the way we're going to approach this one. Since the block does not accelerate vertically. Okay, what do I mean by that? It's not accelerating off the table. It's accelerating to the left, but it's not accelerating upwards. So since 
it's not accelerating vertically, upward and downward forces must be balanced. And that's going to help us set up our equation. Our equation, this is a Newton's first law concept because we have balanced forces. And Newton's first law would be applied by going forces going up equal forces going down. Now look back at the picture. How many forces are going up? One, two. Since there are two forces going up, we will add them together. And it will be normal force plus h sine theta, which was what? h sine theta, that was the 15.3 newtons, equals one force going down, which would be 20 newtons. Well, finally, how do we solve for normal force? Subtract 15 newtons from both sides. And the normal force is 20 minus 20 minus 15.3, which is about 4.7 newtons. A little trickier of a problem, but it still involves the same principles that we're currently working on. <laughs> Newton's second law. Well, let's start with the definition. The definition of Newton's second law, which I'm going to abbreviate N2L, says that a net force, which is an unbalanced force, causes mass to accelerate. I'm going to abbreviate acceleration right there at the end. So net force, the abbreviation we're going to use for that is F sub net causes, well, that would be equals a mass, that would be m, to accelerate. And there's our equation, net force equals mass times acceleration. Now, net force, we could also write as a causing force minus an opposing force. So if we have two forces going in opposite directions, we subtract the bigger one from the smaller one. Okay, so we could abbreviate this as causing force minus opposing force, that would be the net force, and that's equal to ma. So that's another way we could write. This is the way I'm going to write Newton's second law pretty much all the time. Free body diagrams and how to solve. Draw an object and all the forces acting on it. Remember to draw only forces. If you are given other, for other vectors like acceleration and velocity, you can put them near the, uh, the picture, but don't put them on the diagram itself. Put them off, off to the side. The only thing that gets attached to the diagram are forces only. And then the next step, of course, is to apply the equation net force equals ma, okay, which is causing force minus opposing force equals ma. Let's take a look. Example one. We have a 30 newton block pulled across a surface by a 50 newton force. So let's draw ourselves a surface. There's the block. We have a 30 newton block that's the weight not the mass we know that because of the unit right here so the force due to gravity is 30 newtons we're going to need to use that in a minute now it's pulled across by some force that i'm going to call f and that's 15 newtons there has to be a normal force and it says the force of friction is three newtons. So we're gonna draw a friction force going back the other way and little f equals three newtons. 
and says, what's the acceleration of the block? Well, if you're accelerating, you're accelerating horizontally. So this is horizontal acceleration, okay? How do we know this? Because again, the block is not going up and down. It's accelerating to the side. Now, since these forces here, normal force and gravity are balanced, that must mean normal force is also 30 newtons. Okay, what's the acceleration? Well, if, if it's asking acceleration and we're given forces, this is a Newton's second law problem. So what do we do? Causing force minus opposing force equals ma. Clearly we need the mass, so we better find it. We do that by using our force of gravity equation. Remember, gravity equals mg? Well, solving for little m, you divide both sides by g. And it's f sub g over g. So I take our 30 Newton weight divided by 10 Newtons per kilogram, and we can see the mass would be 3 kilograms. So at this step right here, go ahead and divide away the mass. And then we'll plug in. We've got the acceleration now. It's going to be causing force minus opposing force divided by mass. The causing force was the 15 because it causes the acceleration to the right. The opposing force is going to be friction because it acts in the opposite direction to acceleration. So we're going to go 50 newtons minus 3 newtons divided by the 3 kilograms of mass right here. The acceleration would be 12 newtons over 3 kilograms or 4 newtons per kilogram. You could also write 4 meters per second squared. Either unit is acceptable. Both of them are proper units for acceleration. Number two, we have a 10 kilogram block. This time we're given the mass. The 10 kilogram block pulled at a constant speed of three meters per second by a force of 10 Newtons. What is the force of friction between the block and the table? Let's draw a picture of this. So here's our surface. Here's our block. We have the weight, the force due to gravity is equal to mg. We have a 20 Newton force pulling this way. We have friction force, but we don't know what it is. We're actually trying to find that. We have normal force acting upward, and we know this is a 12 kilogram, uh, excuse me, 10 kilogram block. So the force due to gravity would be 10 kilograms times 10 for G, or 100 newtons of force. That makes the normal force also 100 newtons of force. Here's the key part about this problem. Constant speed. Since the block moves with constant speed. The horizontal forces, which are F and friction, must be balanced. They must be equal to each other. So what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that friction actually equals the pulling force F, which is 20 newtons. So this is 20 newtons. Friction is also 20 newtons in order to be moving at a constant speed.